Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD, tonight. Um, I'm talking with you tonight from Austin, Texas, where I have permanently relocated now. Uh, many of you know I've shut down my clinical practice, but I am still working full time, um, developing education materials for you and uh, running these webinars and uh, in the process of designing a new community that should be launching sometime in July for people living with Lyme. So a lot on my plate still. Um, it's good to be in the sunshine and heat down here compared to Seattle, though, so I am enjoying that. I am joined tonight by my two Basinjis who are um, sleeping around me here, so we may see some movement in the background. If you see something kind of black and furry, that's a Basinji. Uh, for those of you that are new, welcome, and I see a lot of uh, new people here tonight. Um, I'm also seeing a lot of people returning, and to, welcome back to you as well, too. For those of you that um, are new, there's a couple ways you can participate. Number one, you can actually write a question to me. Um, take the bold move on your first step or first time here. And the way you do that is on the bottom of your screen, on the right-hand side of the screen, there is a chat box. You can write your question to me there. Um, the only thing I ask is try to be short with your questions. Questions that give me too much detail, too much history do not work out for this kind of a format. And uh, I've already done a quick perusal of some of the questions. Some of, some of them I just may not be able to answer it. When you give me too long and detailed of a history, that just doesn't work for this kind of a format. But feel free to write a question to me there, and I'll, I'll, uh, we'll see if I can get to it. Okay. The other way you can participate is to um, hear and read the questions as I um, get to them. Uh, for those of you that are in the live version, you'll actually be able to see those uh, questions on your screen actually post, but in the recorded version, they don't show up. But see what responses I give. There's a lot of good learning that can take place um, as I try to respond to questions that others have. Um, so a word tonight, We have this is the largest group I've ever had signed up for one of these webinars. We have over 200 people tonight. And so I anticipate we're going to have many more questions than I can get to. Um, so just be aware of that. If I don't get to your question, it does not mean I purposely avoided you, all right? I know I get some questions sometimes from people afterwards asking, why did you avoid my question? Um, I don't avoid anything, all right? I, I take them as they come, but I'm anticipating I will not be able to get through everything tonight. As usual, I am creating a recording of tonight's webinar. And um, after the webinar is over and after I walk the dogs and I fed myself, I'll come back and do a quick edit of the webinar and create a synopsis of that webinar as well too. Uh, tomorrow morning, um, you'll go ahead and get an email from me announcing that the, that, the, that the video is ready to be viewed and the synopsis is done. Um, and that will be in the, in the, the email I send to you. Um, in addition, uh, tomorrow morning when you get that email from me, you'll be able to sign up for the next series of webinars that begin in June. Um, so this completes the May series. I do, I do three each month. Next uh, Thursday, it happens to be the 31st, I believe, and so we'll be off on that day. But um, in June, I'll be doing three uh, webinars again in June for you. So um, keep your eye out for that email because you'll be able to sign up for the next set of webinars as well, too. All right. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get to some of these questions. All right. Hello, Alex, let's see. I've been using Mycopole binder for a few months and have noticed that my gums and teeth have begun hurting a little bit after I began using this product. Have you seen this in your patients? Any side effects you have seen? Thanks. Um, so Alex is talking about a product that we use to bind uh, mold toxins in a person, and it's a product by research nutritionals called Mycopole. And Mycopole has a number of binders in it. Um, to be honest, Alex, I haven't seen that product lead to the kind of symptoms that you're describing, okay? There is a rule of medicine I have, I call it the Marty Ross uh, a rule of medicine, which is anything can happen to anyone with anything. So there are common side effects that people can get, but um, there are those things that happen to us that are not average side effects. And perhaps that might be one that's happening with you, but I would not say it's common. And when we get to binders like this, one of the more common side effects is potentially constipation can develop. And any binder that has charcoal in it, uh, activated charcoal, and I can't remember what the Mycopole does or not, we'll look here in a minute. Yeah, binders that have um, activated charcoal in them can remove minerals, and removing minerals sometimes can lead to hair loss, actually. 
So if you happen to be on binders that have activated charcoal in them, you start losing hair, uh, a couple of things you should do. Number one, you should talk to your doctor who can order some blood tests to make sure you don't have low iron or low thyroid because those are common causes of, of hair loss. But if those come back negative and you're on a binder that has activated charcoal in it, uh, what you could do is to replace those minerals. And there's a product I like using by research nutritionals called Trace Minerals. And that's what I use to replace it if people get into hair loss problems, okay? Let's just do a quick screen share here because I'll go ahead and we'll look and see if there, I can't remember um, if there is charcoal in that product or not. Um, so let me get a screen share here. All right, so um, let's see here. There you go. All right, so. This is my supplement store, Marty Ross MD Supplements. Um, as we discussed tonight, if we talk about various um, generic supplements or other supplements and you wonder, what am I talking about? You can use the search bar here to see what products I might recommend. So for this product called Mycopole, I'm just gonna go ahead and write it in here. So Mycopole is a product by Research Nutritionals. And um, let's see here, we'll just pull the label up. So yeah, it, it does have activated charcoal in it. And uh, again, the one side effect I really see with that sometimes can be hair loss. Okay, but beyond that, I, I have not seen the kind of side effect problem um, that you're reporting here, okay? All right, I'll go back here. All right, all right, good luck to you, Alex. Thanks for your question. All right. Hello, Lynn. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. After a long remission, my son has mysterious symptoms, and it's not clear if they are from reactivated Lyme, BART, or something else. They don't appear to be yeast. Would cryptolepis, knotweed, and cinnamon clove oregano oil for growing and persistent Lyme and BART, and biocidin for biofilms, be an effective way to hedge bets while waiting to see if symptoms persist become clearer? If so, how long would it be good to take them for? Is there something you would do differently in this uncertain situation? And is pulsing a better option than continuous low-level herbal supplementation for policing? All right, so it's a good question. So um, as Lynn points out, um, or Lynn makes a good point of showing something that I've, I've tried to teach everyone here, when, whenever somebody looks like they might have a relapse of either Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, the first step to try to figure out if it is one of those is to look and see if there might be too many intestinal yeast. And I know some of you that are new to my webinars are thinking, what, what do yeast have to do with this? Well, keep in mind that when you have tick-borne illnesses, regardless of what the infection is, Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, any of those infections, the main reason you feel poorly is that the, white, the immune system in trying to attack those germs manufactures a bunch of chemicals called cytokines, okay? And those cytokines um, are good, they turn the immune system on, but if the immune system does a poor job dealing with the problem, it eventually is gonna make too many cytokines. And too many cytokines are what we call Lyme disease symptoms. They're also what we call too many yeast symptoms. They're also what we call bold toxin symptoms, okay? All of those conditions lead your white blood cells to produce too many cytokines. So too many cytokines make it so you can't think, giving you brain fog, uh, can disturb your sleep centers, uh, interfere with how your hormonal systems work. So you often get low hormone problems, um, give you fatigue, make you hurt all over, et cetera, et cetera. So those symptoms that we call Lyme symptoms and mold toxicity symptoms and too many yeast living in your intestine symptoms, they all look the same, all right? So when you're in treatment or if you have been in treatment, even a year or two years after you stop herbal or prescription antibiotics, if you get a big decline, think first, could it be intestinal yeast overgrowth? And things that make you wonder, could it be intestinal yeast overgrowth are increased sugar cravings, increased intestinal gassiness or bloating. Um, sometimes uh, certain people, when you uh, have too many yeast in the intestines, they release toxins that interact with the skin that will give you more pimples and acne or make your eczema worse. And in women, think of uh, too many yeast if you start having vaginal yeast infections or vaginal discharge, okay? So 
there is no test that's perfect for if you have too many yeast. So I want you to know that if you're telling me you don't have, he doesn't have yeast, if they did it with a test, that's not reliable. You really need to look at those symptoms that I was just talking about, okay? All right. So, um, and then the next step to try to figure out, could it be one reactivation of one of the infections is to look back at the first time or the last time he had some of these infections and try to see, is he having a return of those same symptoms, all right? So for instance, if it was uh, Bartonella he had, symptoms that can suggest Bartonella would be pain in the soles of the feet, air hunger, sometimes a lot of depression and anxiety, uh, sometimes joint pains with that, um, sometimes severe cognitive impairment, all right? So if he had any of those before, and those are the predominant symptoms that are back now, that could suggest that Bartonella is there, all right? But if you really can't figure it out and you're pretty sure it's not yeast, then the next step is to start treating for the possibility of a Lyme or a Bartonella relapse, depending on what his symptoms are, right? And, and you haven't really told me what his symptoms are, all right? But so in terms of herbal options that you could use to treat uh, Lyme and Bartonella, yes, Japanese knotweed is, and Cryptolepis, both have the ability to kill growing and persister Lyme and Bartonella. The grapefruit uh, and the liposomal cinnamon clove oregano does as well too. All three of those can treat growing and these hibernator persister um, growth states, okay? Um, I'll say more about that here in a minute. So that's a nice combination. I don't think you necessarily need the biocidin though. And the reason I don't think you need the biocidin is uh, biocidin, although they market themselves as being the thing that removes biofilms, any of the volatile oils can do that as well too. All right, so your cinnamon clove oregano is gonna remove biofilms as well too. So I don't think you need the biocidin to do that, all right? And then in terms of pulsing, if Bartonella is involved, I do not like pulsing when Bartonella is there, all right? So pulsing everyone means uh, using antibiotics for a number of days on and then taking a certain number of days off. Keep in mind that may work for Lyme. And the reason that can work for Lyme is that Lyme um, basically is a very slow growing germ. It may replicate itself about every four weeks, maybe every eight weeks. And so therefore in the period of time that you're not on the herbal antibiotics, it's not gonna run rampant and come back again. It's not gonna regrow itself aggressively, okay? But when you get to Bartonella and also Babesia, those replicate about every 24 hours. And so if you're pulsing during that period of time that you're off the pulse, those germs are coming back. So I haven't been a big fan of pulsing for Bartonella and Babesia for that reason, basically, okay? Um, so yeah, I, I think it sounds reasonable to give those herbs a try. Dosing that I might look at using in an adult, um, and I don't know how big your, your son is, but and an average adult, I might look at dosing up to 30 drops twice a day in the knotweed, 30 drops. Um, well, actually, on the cryptolepis, if you're going to be using it for Lyme and Bartonella, you might do about a half teaspoonful three times a day on that. And the liposomal cinnamon, clove, oregano capsules, um, you would wind up doing one pill twice a day on that. Okay, those are standard doses that I would use. And yeah, in my practice, um, I had over the last uh, few months, been well, actually over the last six months or so using knotweed and cinnamon clove oregano and cryptolepis as Bartonella Lyme treatments. All right. So not using the traditional cat's claw or toba or a hutinia sedacuda, but rather just using those three. I have done that in my practice and had good results with that. All right. So I hope that gives you some uh, good answers there. So everyone, I just want to talk terminology here real quick. Uh, so many of you are probably familiar with this idea, but we discovered about five years ago for Lyme and about two or three years ago for Bartonella that a lot, um, some of the germs uh, move out of a growth state into a hibernating state, or we call those persisters. And the, uh, maybe about 10% can exist in a persister state, according to lab experiments, maybe 90% will be in a growth state. But the trouble is those persisters um, are difficult because traditional antibiotics we might use don't work for them, all right? So there's been a lot of research going on trying to figure out what do we use for persisters? Well, herbally, liposomal cinnamon, clove oregano, Japanese knotweed, cryptolepis can be very useful against persisters. And so I have used those in my practice. Prescriptively, things like methylene blue and dapsone might be useful against uh, persisters. 
and for uh, Lyme and Bartonella persisters, and for just Lyme persisters, disulfiram can be useful for that as well too. Okay, all right. Thanks for your question, Lynn. Good luck to you. Hello, Colleen. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. For patients who have both yeast and mold, is candida treatment worthwhile in the meantime while maintaining mold remediation and treatment, or should you hold off on treating the candida until you've addressed the mold? I read in a candida forum that you won't get rid of the yeast if you still have mold. Um, thank you for all of your help. Um, I disagree with what you read. <laughs> I, you can you can take care of yeast while you're still not while you still have mold toxins in you. And in fact, I do that all the time in my practice. So based on my clinical experience, I would say, yeah, you can get rid of the yeast, and you probably should still be dealing with that. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks for your question, Colleen. Hello, Cesar. Let's see. My 14-year-old daughter was diagnosed recently with Bartonella. Three years struggling with uh, depression, ADHD, rage, anxiety, panic attacks, and fatigue. Cunningham panel with high anti-dopamine receptor D1 blood test with high SED rate, or high SED rate, that is, and low immunoglobulin subclass 4, low complement uh, C3C and C4C, uh, doxy 100 plus fluconazole, liposomal cinnamon, clove, oregano, and biocidin. After 10 days of her, her psychiatric symptoms got better, two months now, and she's 80% better. Great, great. Uh, one, looking the blood test, she was having inflammation in some markers of autoimmune disease. What comes first? The Bartonella causing the PANS, or did she have PANS and the psychiatric symptoms started after she gets infections like Bartonella? Is there a way to test for this? Usually with your patients, if you cure the Bartonella, the PANS goes away or they still get symptoms after getting common infections like COVID. Two, our doctor wants to keep the current treatment for a total of six months and transition to herbal treatment for an extended, let's see here, let me see if I can find your second part of your question here. All right. So, Cesar, I'm not, I'm not finding the second part to your question, but I can make some comments here. Um, so it's hard to say what came first, the PANS or the, the BART. In the end, it doesn't matter. If you've got BART and you have PANS, treat the BART because it is likely the major cause of the PANS, all right? And fortunately, you've already done the trial. You can tell it's, it's working, all right? In terms of everyone, this treatment that um, Cesar is using here with his daughter, his daughter is using, this is a treatment that I use, and may, maybe your doctor got the idea from me, or maybe they found it somewhere else, but this looks very much like something I would do, right? So, um, uh, so the doxy and fluconazole is very useful against Bartonella. The fluconazole, I got that idea a number of months ago uh, based on reviewing research that had um, come out of Johns Hopkins University about three or four years ago now showing that um, in studies they did looking at what would treat growing and what would treat persisting Bartonella, they took an agent from each major antimicrobial family. So for the tetracyclines, they used doxycycline, not minocycline. For the macrolides, they used azithromycin, not uh, clarithromycin, also known as um, um, biaxin. And for the azoles, this family of antibiotics called the azoles, they used clotrimazole, not fluconazole, not tinidazole, but clotrimazole. Now, uh, clotrimazole is only available in cream and not in pill formulations. It's often used for skin yeast and fungal infections and vaginal yeast and vaginal um, fungal infections. But it really, clotrimazole did great in the lab. And trying to come up with new ideas of things to try, about a year ago, I started introducing fluconazole in my practice. And um, I found really remarkable results doing it. And the thing that's nice about it is it also trip picks up your persisters then, okay? So on this regimen you're on right now, the doxyfluconazole, I'm not sure you necessarily need the cinnamon clove oregano or that you need the biocidin. 
that basically the doxyfluconazole might be enough. Um, if you want to continue the cinnamon clove oregano, you could do that. The biocyte, I think, is a little bit extra. As I said earlier, you're already dealing with biofilms by being on the cinnamon clove oregano. Okay, that's my commentary. Obviously, it's working. I don't think you're hurting yourself by continuing it, though. Okay. Um, in terms of how long to treat, generally, what I like to do is let the symptoms guide me. Um, so an average treatment length for a Bartonella infection is about four to six months. So I can understand where your physician may be coming up with the six month idea. Um, but at six months, if everything's 100% well, I generally want to make sure that we've got symptoms all resolved for at least two months, and then I consider stopping. If you're not 100% well at that point, I think it's reasonable to think about switching over to an all herbal regimen. Um, so if you're primarily treating Bartonella, what you might do is still stay on a cinnamon clove oregano, and you might add to that uh, uh, a Houtonia Sita Acuda. A Houtonia Sita Acuda, definitely good against treating growing Bartonella. Your cinnamon clove oregano would pick up persisters and help with the biofilm. And so I've, I've done that for some of those too. Reasons to think about switching to herbal is um, herbal antibiotics tend to do less of a harm job if you will, harmful um, job or disrupting the gut microbiome. All right, now in Lyme disease, it's always a trade-off or in Bartonella, it's always a trade-off. Yes, sometimes you need to use prescription antibiotics to get the germs under control, but there's always the risk that you're injuring the gut microbiome and that gut microbiome, um, if it gets too injured, may in the end perpetuate some of the ongoing illness, okay? At least there's some theories that it might. So in my practice, I always work as best I can to protect the gut. I put tons of probiotics in somebody. And when possible, I tend to use herbal antibiotics rather than doing prescriptions. Okay. All right. So, so thank you for that question. Good luck for your daughter. Hello, Jen. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I was treated for Lyme, Babesia, and mold toxin illness. Mold was the major player. I got out of the mold and used binders for six to eight months. I'm about 90% better, but still struggle with, struggle with neck pain, which was my worst symptom. I have some degenerative changes in my cervical spine that correspond to the location of my pain, which I would describe as a burning nerve pain that radiates at times. I'm a physical therapist and notice that often my neck pain is not mechanically provoked as one would expect and physical therapy interventions do not help. The flares which occur about every two weeks are accompanied by systemic symptoms such as itching, generalized neck crepitus and pain, mild symptoms in other joints, tinnitus and migraine. Stress, lack of sleep and cold exposure are triggers. Treatment for mast cell activation syndrome with quercetin and um, histoquel has been quite helpful, but there is still room for improvement. I tried doxy and multiple antimicrobial herbs for persistent Lyme and Babesia and disulfiram. Jen, let me see if I can find the second part of your question here. Ah. Darn it, Jen, I apologize, but your rest of your question did not show up here. Um, let me just make a few comments. So in terms of your remaining symptoms, you're raising a good point is, I think you're raising a point is, could, is this really Lyme? Is this really mold toxicity? Or is this something to do with a mechanical problem in your neck and possibly even giving some of that neuropathy? The only thing that makes me think this may still have an infection base, not necessarily a mold toxicity base, but an infection base, is the cycling of symptoms about every two weeks. Um, Lyme, the Lyme germ can produce a cycling of symptoms that usually are about average every four weeks, you'll see some flaring. But in some people, that could be two-week cycles, some people three-week cycles. And the crepitus that you're talking about, that kind of crackling going on in the neck, tends to be more of a symptom than we see with Lyme rather than Bartonella and rather than uh, mold, um, uh, mold, uh, mold issues as well too, all right? Keep in mind with uh, treating for Lyme that an average, if you have chronic Lyme, not acute Lyme, but chronic Lyme, 
it can sometimes take um, one to two years to get those germs under control with antimicrobials, all right? And I, you may have been getting ready to ask me some questions about antimicrobials, but I, I don't know, I, I, I can't see that part of your question, all right? So, I'm, so I would wonder more about, I would wonder, and again, I, this is a, you know, this is a webinar setting where I don't get to ask you a bunch of clarifying questions, but from what you've written and based on my comments, I would wonder about Lyme still being here, okay? couple other things that I would suggest you think about. Um, so I understand physical therapy is not helping you. Sometimes in these situations, what I like doing for more the mechanical and the inflammatory or the neuropathy nature, I find acupuncture in these situations to be very helpful for people. So you may want to consider that. If you are a person that has um, does not like needles, <laughs> I'm one of those people. Um, Consider getting somebody that works more with Japanese style acupuncture rather than somebody that's using true Chinese medicine style. Uh, in Japanese style, they just put the needle into the skin, not deep into the muscle. All right. So it tends to be a little bit more comfortable, um, can still have great results. That's what I tend to respond to for my problems. All right. And number two, for this ongoing crepitus and, uh, and pain syndrome, even neuropathy in the neck, um, consider um, um, the peptide called BPC-157. So, uh, and, and so you may be familiar with this, but for those of you that aren't, let me talk about peptides real quick. So um, peptides are naturally occurring substances in us. And we have identified over a hundred different peptides that our body makes. There is one that is made in the stomach lining called BPC-157. And BPC-157 has been mostly used by athletes because it's been observed to repair joint injury, muscle pain, tendon pain. And in my practice, I've noticed it helps with neuropathy as well, too. So it repairs damage, all right? So um, the way I like using BPC-157, you can get it in a pill form. There's a company called Integrative Peptides that makes it. You can find it at my supplement store if you want. And it's one pill twice a day to start. Give it a couple month trial to see if it's making a difference as well too. Okay, so I think you were gonna to try to ask me about antimicrobials, but I can't tell what you've used to make a comment on what to try next, all right? So anyhow, I hope that gives you some useful information. Everyone, I'm gonna do a quick screen share here too. All right, so let me get over there. All right, so in terms of the BPC-157, um, you can take a look at, at my store under the supplements here and take a look over at this integrative peptides tab here. And this is the BPC-157 here, okay? All right, and then if you're trying to figure out what these peptides are and what options you might have for peptides, consider taking a look at my, my website, Treatline by Marty Ross, MD. And take a look on the online Lyme guide. If you were to look under, gosh, where did I put it? Probably take a look under immune system. Let's see if I put it there. Yeah, let me do it up here. I'm just gonna put it in a search bar. So there is a whole article that I have written called Key oral strategies to repair and restore and Lyme and mold toxicity, okay? This is my peptides article, all right? Take a look here. I review the various kind of oral peptides. Here's the whole list of them right here. And then down here, I talk about a strategy to use peptides in terms of helping you, okay? Oops, I guess I was logged in there. Anyhow, all right, we go back here. All right. Good luck to you, Jen. Thank you for that question. Hello, Angela. Let's see. Blessing to you for helping us. You're welcome. Let's see. 20 plus years Lyme, diagnosed three years ago, two weeks ago, finished my third year having 10 weeks IV daily row seven. I have MCA, yeah, so mast cell activation syndrome. Infectious MD decided I do not, I, I not do Octoba and Casclaw. She felt it is best to use Cryptolepis 
as we tried cinnamon clove oil and had very bad stomach pains. Can't take NSAIDs or turmeric as the same happens. I have high BART and EBV with much inflammation, bad leg paresthesias, um, fasciitis, joint muscle pain, bad low back pain, anxiety, brain fog, et cetera. Did one milliliter crypto uh, week number one in AM, this week number two, doing two milliliters in the morning with food is best, having increased BART symptoms and sweats, racing heart, activated charcoal helps ease symptoms, is that okay? Should we add liposomal glutathione and or BPC-157 or just stay this course slowly raising crypto for now and then what later and when? Thanks. Ah, so Angela, this gets complicated. Um, I need to know more of what you've been on before and how you responded to the various things. Um, in term to help you figure out where you go next, I, I, I would need to get more of a review of your history here. Uh, but in terms of cryptolepis, when I'm using it, you can use it again to treat Babesia. You can also use it to treat Lyme, and you can use it to treat Bartonella. For Lyme and Bartonella, it treats growing and persister forms, okay? Um, keep in mind, it, it can sometimes be upsetting to the stomach, but it tends not to have the same trouble doing that that the cinnamon, clove, oregano might, all right? In terms of cryptolepis, I often am gonna to try to dose it anywhere from a half teaspoon, which is 2.5 milliliters um, three times a day to five milliliters, which is a teaspoonful three times a day. If I've got somebody that is, has to have a lot of Herx reactions, I will start low and slow, just like you're doing, okay? If you get to a higher dose and you find that the cryptolepis is starting to irritate your stomach, that may be due more to the alcohol content of the cryptolepis, because it's, um, it's in in uh, an alcohol, it's an alcohol-based extraction. If that starts happening, what you can do is boil some water and put like an ounce in a, in a glass and take the amount of cryptolepis you wanna take and put it in that boiled water. And what will happen is a lot of the alcohol will steam off and therefore it tends to be less irritating, okay? And then regarding the cinnamon clove oregano, you know, volatile oils are, are, you know, if you put some on your skin, you're gonna feel a burn from that, for instance, okay? And these are volatile oils. And so your stomach can get irritated from it too, and some people, not everyone. What I tend to do for my patients that get irritated taking volatile oils like the cinnamon clove oregano is to have them chew licorice tablets first and then take, um, and then take the pill. What happens when you chew licorice, and that's a type of licorice called deglycerated licorice, if you chew licorice tablets, about two of them, maybe five minutes, 10 minutes before you take your uh, uh, cinnamon clove oregano, what happens is the uh, licorice mixes with your saliva and together they create a microscopic gelatinous coat that can protect the stomach lining. And so I've been able to ha help a lot of people tolerate it that way as well too, okay? In terms of what's next, I need to know where you've been first. <laughs> and unfortunately, we don't have a good way of being able for me to dialogue with you in this kind of a setting. Okay. All right. Good luck to you. Hello, David. Let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. We know that deer serum has a a property that kills the um, Borrelia, preventing deer from being infected by the Lyme bug. When dogs get bit by the American dog tick, some of them will get paralysis starting in the back legs and migrate internally to the front legs. Some vets will take the serum from the dogs with hyperimmune systems who have been bitten, but no symptoms or recover on their own and treat these ill dogs so they will recover. Has this been tried in humans? Why not? You know, I'm not aware if it's been tried, so I, I can't say uh, why not. <laughs> I just, I don't know. Um, it's a good question to no. know, uh, and I'm just, I'm not aware of that, okay? All right, thanks for questioning. Hello, Mary, let's see, hi, Dr. Ross. How long do you typically treat with Tindamax? Is this safe to take long term? Thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. So everyone, Tindamax is also known as tinidazole. 
And tinidazole is one of those azoles that I mentioned earlier. So the azoles are the anti-yeast medicines like fluconazole and itraconazole that we now know can be very useful to treat Bartonella. And tinidazole is traditionally has been used more to treat um, the cyst form of the Lyme germ and maybe intracellular Lyme as well too, okay? And has some ability to break up biofilms as well too. I have used it for up to six months in my practice as my anti-cyst agent and as something to break up biofilms, okay? Now, where I get this information about biofilms, um, a number of years ago, Eva uh, Ch uh, Choppy, um, Dr. Choppy uh, is a researcher um, in New Haven, Connecticut. She conducted some studies um, looking at uh, various uh, antibiotics to see what they would do against biofilm. And of prescription antibiotics, the one that did the best was tinidazole. All prescription antibiotics had some ability to break up biofilm. And um, also in her study, um, uh, cat's claw and otobabark broke up about 100% of the biofilm. And they did better than what the tinidazole did. I think that broke up about 90% of the biofilm. So uh, tinidazole can be effective as an anti-biofilm agent and also can be effective against um, treating the cyst form of the germ. But I'll use it up to six months at a time. Okay. All right. Thanks for that question, Mary. Hello, Heather. Let's see. Part one. Hi, Dr. Ross. I'm 49 and have run an animal shelter for 30 years. I tested positive for BART through Mayo in March of 21. I was given two weeks of azithromycin and rifampin, but didn't feel much better. I also had endocarcinoma in my rod for lung stage 1A, March 21 removed. No further treatment and have taken uh, Corlanor uh, 5 milligrams for tachycardia for years, for two years. I started with gastroparesis issues in 2019 that have subsided except constipation control with magnesium citrate. I've tested positive for Lyme through Igenix and BART through Galaxy in May of 2021 and had no treatment until September of 2022 with six weeks pick line of two grams of BID of ceftriaxone. I think you mean BID, it says SID there, but um, my chief complaint is lightheadedness and fatigue. POTS diagnosed by Mayo. In April this year, I began seeing a local uh, Arizona naturopathic doctor. He uses vibrant tests and said that I have three Borrelia, two BART, taxoplasmosis, and Babesia. I have been started and switched on um, HRT meds due to perimenopause three times in the last four months from synthetic to bioidentical. Uh, let's see, there's a second part here. Then to a cream with estriol progesterone and testosterone with about a week gap in between each one. In the last two weeks is when I was switched on these uh, hormone replacement therapy meds and when the palpitation started, but I can't pinpoint the day. They switched to get me off synthetic, but then thought the troche was potentially causing palpitation, so stopped and switched to the most recent that I've taken for about five days. The ND put me on the following, which started 35 days ago with ramping up for each item that is herbal. Medica Mediclear plus powder, that's a multivitamin, everyone. Um, Ester C bio, it's vitamin D. Vitamin D3, melatonin, liposomal glutathione, tr true niagen pro, CoQ10, I think, Heather, you have more. Oh, boy. Heather, this is getting to be too long. I, I'm sorry. I, I can't answer this kind of a question in this format. Again, my, my, my forum works better for um, shorter questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to pass on your question. It's just too long. I can't deal. I, these formats doesn't work out for these really long, long questions like this, unfortunately. All right. All right, let me go ahead and move on here. Hello, Susan. Whenever I sweat, 
which is rare. I noticed that my sweat is absolutely foul smelling and not the typical gymnasium smell. Do you know which infection does this or could this be something else? So um, the way that you remove toxins in your body are two different ways, or fat soluble toxins is two ways. Number one, the major way is that your liver will take fat-based toxins and uh, apply a water soluble group to them and they then get moved into the gallbladder and your bile system and then moved out into the intestines and in a water soluble form, you will poop them out, okay? The other way that you can remove um, uh, fat-based toxins is to sweat them out. Now, if the liver is getting overwhelmed with having to process fat-based toxins, you will wind up sweating more of those out. And so usually a foul smelling sweat means you're having toxins coming out in your sweat basically, all right? And so, um, and it may be because the liver is overwhelmed, it may also be that you're having some toxins like your Lyme toxins that are getting reabsorbed out of the intestines back into um, the bloodstream. So what can sometimes happen with mold Lyme toxins if you're producing a lot of Lyme toxins is that um, the liver may not be able to transform them to a water soluble form. They'll go, they'll come out still as a fat soluble form, go out into the intestines and then get reabsorbed again, all right? So what I do in situations like this, where I've got patients that have developed uh, foul smelling sweat, is I wanna support the liver being able to detox better. And I also wanna put them on a binder to start pulling out toxins uh, fat soluble toxins that make their way into the intestines so they can't get reabsorbed again. All right. So usually what I'll wind up doing is start a person on liposomal glutathione. Um, liposomal means it's microscopically wrapped in fat. Glutathione is a uh, very powerful antioxidant that's made in every one of our cells to repair damage. And it is the main detox chemical that's used by the liver. All right. So sometimes what happens when the liver gets overwhelmed with toxins, it burns out its glutathione supply and it can't detox well enough. So you can fill that gas tank back up again or the glutathione tank back up again. And if you're gonna use glutathione, make sure you're getting a product that is absorbed. And the one product on the market that has data showing that it is absorbed is the product called Trifortify by Research Nutritionals. They've, they've done some studies showing marked improvements in red blood cell levels, meaning it's absorbed out of the stomach, okay? And so when I've got somebody who's gotten really problems with um, having a toxin spill over into their sweat like this, I usually will wind up doing a teaspoonful of the Trifortify product two times a day, all right? They have two flavors. There's an orange and a watermelon flavor. Uh, they're flavored because glutathione is rich in sulfur, so they're meant to kind of camouflage that sulfur flavor, but Either one of those would work here. It's got to pick what flavor you want on that, okay? And then in terms of how to bind up some of those toxins in the intestines, what I would do is either a mycopole uh, by Research Nutritionals or a comparable product called GI Detox Plus, and it's a plus sign, not plus all spelled out, by um, uh, Biobotanical um, or Biocide and Botanicals, that is. And either one, they're similar products. If you look at the ingredients, they're very similar to each other. And what I would do is start at one pill one time a day. And as long as you don't, uh, I would wait about seven days. And if you're not herxing, well, not her herxing isn't the correct term, but if you haven't had a worsening from um, pulling those toxins out, then I would increase to two pills one time a day. All right, so keep in mind, when you start moving toxins, like you start binding them, um, that, that can trigger more toxins to enter the bloodstream behind those ones you just removed. And that can trigger a cytokine surge. And so you might start feeling more body pain, more achiness, more fatigue, okay? If that kind of situation happens when we're killing Lyme germs, we call that a herx, but that's increased cytokines because your immune system sees dead germ parts, all right? But if you get increased cytokines for a different reason, we don't call that a herx, but it looks like a herx, okay? All right, so anyhow. That's what I, I usually suggest my patients in this kind of a situation is uh, liposomal glutathione, one teaspoon twice a day, and then look at a mycopole or a GI detox product, start at one a day, and then increase um, after about a week up to two pills one time a day, all right? In terms of timing on your binders, um, they're called binders, all right? So they will bind other things that you take them with potentially. 
So usually what I have people do is stop their medicines and supplements at least 30 minutes before you take the binders, and then you can resume taking them two hours later. Okay, so that's a good timing on that. And then the other thing, um, you can eat any time, although an ideal time to eat something is 30 minutes after you take your binders. And the reason that's an ideal time is if you have a gallbladder and the liver has processed these uh, the toxins out, they'll get stored in the gallbladder. Eating causes a gallbladder to contract and squeeze stuff out, all right? And you're, where, the, where they come out of the, bile, the gallbladder to the bile duct and then out into the intestines happens to be about 30 minutes downstream from the stomach. So take your binders first, give it 30 minutes for the binders to work down near where the gallbladder releases its stuff, and then you eat and it causes the gallbladder to contract, okay? All right. Um, good luck to you, Susan. Thanks for the question. Actually, so let me just do a quick screen share here. All right, so, um, so this is my supplement store. If you're looking at the binders to help with detox, take a look in my um, detoxification section here. And the binder that I was just talking about, one is that GI Detox. I'm circling it right here for you. Um, the other one is the product called Mycopole by Research Nutritionals, okay? And then in terms of the glutathione, um, you could either use this one called Trifortify Orange or this other one called Trifortify Watermelon, okay? All right. Thanks for the question, Heather. I'm sorry. Um, thanks for that question. Um, I'm actually seeing uh, part two of Heather's question here. I'm, again, Heather, I'm sorry that I turned you down here. I, I think I realize that you may have written me an email earlier. And although, please, everyone, don't don't think you could do this. Heather, I understand you're wanting some input from me. And I, I will go back and relook at your email I think you sent yesterday or the day before. OK, now I'm only making this open for Heather. OK, so I, I don't want to have everyone writing me their separate questions. Uh, but um, yeah, so anyhow. OK, so Heather, I will get back to you. Hello, Wendy. Let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. I'm currently seeing a functional medicine doctor that has me on your protocol since 123.23. Um, I'm being treated for Borrelia, Bartonella, Anaplasma, Toxoplasma, HSV1 and 6, current protocol, liposomal curcumin, uh, 500 milligrams two times a day, um, cat's claw, otobobark, and cryptolepis, one dropper full two times a day. Quercetin, 250 milligram, one capsule, two times a day. Probiosphere, modified citrus pectin, one teaspoon. Let's see, HPA adapt, one capsule, twice a day. Biocide and LSF, one pump, one time a day. Vitamin C, vitamin D, magnesium, multivitamin. I have followed this protocol for four months with no improvement in fatigue, brain fog, achiness, etc. I'm currently having itchiness all over. Any recommendations or changes to the protocol? Two, I was tested for Lyme on 4-25-16, Igenix 1-22-21 MDL Labs, 5-17-21 Vibrant Labs. When do you recommend retesting? Is Igenix the preferred lab? I've seen many specialists and naturopathic doctors since 2015 using various herb supplements, saunas, detox, many rounds of antibiotics. Etc. Okay, so let me just make a comment. Um, I don't believe in retesting. Uh, and I know a number of my medical colleagues want to do retesting. And that's because we as doctors are trained that we need to do testing to figure out where we are. But tick-borne illnesses are maddening because repeat testing does not prove you're done treating or even if the germ is still there. And, and let, me, let me try to explain what I mean by that. So 
the testing that you would have had done through Igenix, MDL, and Vibrant Labs, all are tests that measure whether you're having an antibody reaction against these various tick-borne infections, okay? And your antibody reactions um, can come and go. You could have strong antibody reactions if you have a lot of germ in you, uh, but also if you have a lot of germ in you that's suppressing your immune system, you may not have much antibody reactions, okay? So not having antibody reactions does not mean the germ is gone, especially if you have a lot of symptoms. It just may mean that your immune system is too darn suppressed to be able to make enough of those antibodies, all right? So I, I don't believe in doing retesting. If you ever get a test that shows you have one of the germs, when you go back and retreat somebody again, or when I go back and retreat somebody again, I'm gonna ask about the symptoms of those germs to see if they might still be present. Um, so I would, there is no reliable test that tells you, are there germs still there? Another trend that I see a number of my colleagues doing is to use an Ellispot method, um, either through InfectoLab or Armin Labs. And what an Ellispot does is it looks to see, um, is your immune system reacting by measuring do your T white blood cells react against the proteins of the germs when they're exposed to them, okay? So it's a T cell reaction test. And I know a number of my colleagues, and especially the marketers at InfectoLab and the marketers at Armin Lab are trying to get people to do more of their labs and they're selling a bag of goods saying, if you test and your, um, your Ellispot or your T cell reaction test is negative, well, then that person's probably cured. Well, that's garbage because you can still have a lot of germ load in you that's even suppressing your T cells ability to fight infection as well too, all right? So absence of a reaction either on your Ellispot or in your antibodies does not prove you're getting better. It does not prove the germ is gone, all right? So I just wanna be clear about that. We have no studies that prove what is the best way, uh, or there's no studies we have that prove your germs are gone or that your germ load has been reduced. They don't exist, okay, all right? So anyway, I wanted to clear that up for you there. In terms of what's next for you here, hold on just a minute here. So let's see, you've treated for, Bear with me here, I'm trying to figure it. So we're already at May. So you've treated for about four months. All right, so um, I'll give you a, a few things to think about. So with um, anaplasma in particular, that's usually gonna give you a lot of body achiness, um, muscle achiness. And if, since you got sick, you were on doxycycline or minocycline or tetracycline for at least a month, you probably have cleared anaplasma. There is not a good herbal regimen I have found to deal with anaplasma. All right, so I'll just let you know that. So if you have not done doxycycline for any period of time, you might discuss with your physician whether it might be time to give a, a trial of doxycycline to clear that anaplasma out, all right? All right, now, when you treat Bartonella and you're on something that is effective and it's herbal or prescription, usually by two months, you should start seeing a reduction in those Bartonella symptoms. And if you are not, then it's time to think of changing to a different regimen, all right? So Bartonella symptoms would be things like pain in the balls of the feet, severe thinking problems, neuropathies, um, psychiatric disorders, uh, gastroparesis, where the nerves that cause your intestines to work don't work right, although Lyme can do that as well too. Those are all Bartonella symptoms. And if those aren't getting better, then you need to think about redesigning at least the Bartonella aspect of this treatment. And at this point, uh, of the herbs that you've used, the only herb that would have addressed Bartonella would be the Cryptolepis. Let me see here. Yeah, it would be the Cryptolepis. So you haven't really had a strong Bartonella treatment here. Um, things that you might do for Bartonella would be a, a, um, a Japanese knot. I'm sorry, it would be a, um, a Hutania, Siddha Okuda, all right? 
So you might consider adding those in to help with the Bartonella side of things. In terms of Lyme, the timeline for Lyme improvement, that's hard. So um, there's been studies done looking at how quickly people turn the corner when you're correctly treating the Lyme germ, all right, on something that ultimately works. And what those studies have shown is that by three months, 30% of people start improving. By six months, 60% um, of people start improving. And by nine months, 90%, all right? So at this point, if you've got symptoms that are not Bartonella symptoms um, and they're not improving, it may be that it just needs to be more time, all right? Now, other things to consider. Um, when it comes to treating for Lyme, in my experience, herbal antibiotics have about a, an 85 to 90% chance of working. Various regimens have about that much chance. Prescription antibiotics have about the same chance of working too. But when it comes to Bartonella, your herbal antibiotics stand a chance of helping about 75 well, about 70, 75% of the time, and your prescription antibiotics stand a chance of working, it's about 10% better, okay? So keep that in mind. So if I've got somebody that's not improving, I might consider, do we need to switch over to a prescription antibiotic regimen long enough to get some control of the germs? Or in your situation, if you had a lot of symptoms still suggesting Bartonella, I might still leave you on the same um, herbs for the Lyme, but I might consider uh, changing out what you're doing for the Bartonella, okay? And I hope you can understand this format. I don't get to do a lot of clarifying questions with you to figure out what's the best way to go, all right? So I hope that gives you some insights to talk with your doctor about to see what may be next for you then too, okay? All right, good luck to you. Hello, Mosby, let's see. Are there any herbals or natural remedies that you recommend for fungal component of some of these infections? I keep hearing that Margellans has a fungal element that is not being addressed by the professionals. Thank you. Also, these commercials for new medications tell you to inform your doctor if you have a fungal infection or have gone to places where fungal infections are common. But yet when I ask around, no one, including myself, has been tested for fungals. And the doctors pretend like it's not needed, but it suspiciously looks like they don't know what or how to test. Thank you. All right. So the one thing I want to let you know about Morgellons, Mosby, is I know that there is an opinion out there that Morgellons may have fungus component to it. The truth is when um, samples have been done of those lesions, fungus infection does not seem to grow out of them. All right. So the science would suggest these are not fungus infections, but everyone thinks they are because of what the skin looks like, all right? Um, what I have come to understand about Morgellons is I think it is a skin manifestation of Lyme disease. And it is not fungal. I've not had any benefit in putting people on antifungals for those. What I do have benefit from is just going in and treating the Lyme that usually is involved in 90% of people that have Morgellons, okay? All right, um, good luck to you. Hello, Joyce. Let's see how Dr. Ross. I recently purchased your book and I'm looking forward to reading it. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Ah, great. I, I hope you find it useful. Um, as you probably know, that same information is available online for you as well, too. But uh, sometimes it helps to be able to read it in a, in a book format. And that's why I produced that for you. So good. I hope, I hope you get some benefit out of it. Hello, Carter. Let's see, I get a rapid buildup of dandruff on the top of my head and my hair feels very matted. The tops of my hands also sometimes get red coinciding. Does this sound like some type of skin manifestation of Lyme or Margellans? You know, Carter, I, I don't know because I don't know enough of what else is going on with you and I can't look at your hands, okay, but I will make an observation. So, and, and I kind of mentioned this earlier when I was talking about yeast. So, if you get when I see people that have a lot of skin manifestations, uh, whether it's too many pimples or yeast, whether it's worsening dandruff, or whether it is worsened eczematous uh, or psoriatric kind of rashes, 
always look at what's going on in the gut, okay? If there are too many intestinal yeast growing, they again release toxins that get absorbed into your bloodstream and can interact with the skin, making things like eczema, things like pimples and acne, and things like psoriasis, and things like dandruff. Dandruff also is called seborrhea dermatitis, but making seborrhea dermatitis worse, all right? So um, take a look at my information about how you determine if you have too much yeast. And let me go ahead and do a screen share on that for you. All right, so take a look at my Lyme guide and take a look in the yeast chapter here and this article called A Silent Problem Is It Yeast? And I walk you through how to determine if you might have too many yeasts as a problem, okay? If you do, take a look at my other article over here called Kills and Prevents Yeast, a Brief Guide, where I describe different herbal and prescription options to help get that problem under control. All right, Carter, good luck to you. Thanks for our question. Kristen says, hello from Maine. Hello back at you. Thanks for saying hi, Kristen. Oh, I forget who that was we were just talking about. Um, the person that I just answered a couple questions ago, you have a lot of itchy skin. Um, that sometimes can be because of mast cell activation syndrome, and I think you know that. Um, so in terms of things to look at to control the itchy skin, which would be part of mast cell activation, I'm going to show you an article I've written about steps to control mast cell activation. In your treatment, you may wanna consider looking at uh, increasing your quercetin up to 500 milligrams three times a day and consider adding in another um, herb that can help stabilize your mast cells that are releasing all those histamines. And that is something called luteolin. In addition, I would look at triggers in your environment, like your food that may be triggering allergic reaction. And um, you might even consider starting some antihistamines like Zyrtec or um, uh, stomach acid blockers that have antihistamine uh, potential as well too. The other thing I would point out is the biggest trigger of your mast cells is actually stress. Um, so if, there's, if you have a lot of stress in your life and being sick can give you a lot of stress, uh, try to find ways of managing that stress as well too, okay? All right, so let me let's see here, what am I doing? All right, so in terms of how do you manage mast cell activation, take a look at my immune system section here and look at this article called Mast Cell Activation and Lyme, okay? All right. All right, so mast cells, everyone, are your allergy cells. We've now learned many uh, from research over the last decade or so that in chronic infections like Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia can turn those mast cells on to start releasing histamines a lot easier, okay? And so you'll see some people with um, tick-borne illnesses also have mast cell activation syndrome because the germs, not things you're allergic to, but the germs have actually turned those mast cells on to make and release uh, too many of the histamines, right? Let's see, Wendy, let's see. Oh, uh, AIP elimination, keto diet, currently doing a modified paleo diet. Thank you so much. I think I just gave the next part of your, of your response. I think, Wendy, I think it was you that I was answering earlier. All right, uh, good luck to you. Hello, Alan. Hi, Dr. Ross. I have your book, Hacking Lyme Disease, but I still have a little confusion about the protocols for treating persistent Lyme and Bartonella simultaneously. On page 43 of the book, the protocol for the two for these two is listed as Otobovart, Cat's Claw, 
and the pills combining acinamoclove oregano. However, on page 90, the protocol for persistent Lyme and Bartonella is listed as cryptolepis, Japanese knotweed, and the pills combining cinnamon clove oregano oil. Which do you recommend I start with? Are they equal? Or is the protocol on page 90 recommended if there are no results? Okay. So there's different ways to skin the cat. All right. So first of all, and um, in my, let me see if it's page 43. Hold on. I'm going to flip to page 43. All right. So hold on just a minute here. Okay, so if you've got Lyme and Bartonella, what you're looking at on page 43 is my protocol for the Lyme germ, but you've missed the protocol, which is on page uh, 45 for Bartonella, okay? So you need to do both. So for Bartonella, you would need to add in Otoba, I'm sorry, would need to add in um, Putania and Siddha Okuda, all right? So an herbal protocol that's part of the Ross Lyme support protocol that would treat both Lyme and Bartonella is Otoba bark and cat's claw to treat growing Lyme. And then Otoba, and then, then Siddha Akuda and Hutania to treat growing Bartonella. And then the cinnamon clove oregano capsules would be useful for treating uh, persister Lyme and Bartonella and also treating growing Lyme and Bartonella, okay? Um, the other thing that, that those oils would do, and I don't mention a protocol, they probably break apart biofilm as well too, okay? So that's one option, all right? Another option, let's say you've tried that and you're not getting far enough along, would be to consider using the combination of cryptolepis, Japanese knotweed, and the cinnamon clove oregano, okay? So more recent research that came out a year ago from Johns Hopkins University tells us that the cryptolepis and Japanese knotweed are both very useful at treating growing and persister Lyme and Bartonella, all right? And we already know that the cinnamon clove oregano can help with that as well too, okay? All right, so I hope that kind of clears up some of your confusion there. You can go either place. The protocol, that, I, that my Ross Lyme support protocol is just a good place to start. That article that you're looking further on back in the book is um, gives you other ideas of what to try, okay? Uh, good luck to you, Alan. Thanks for your question. Hello, Ricky. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thanks for answering my question. Can Mepron cause insomnia and mood issues after you've been taking it several months? Thanks again. You know, it's a it's a good question. So um, Mepron, also called Atovaquam, is a medication, a prescription medication that is an anti-malarial that we use to treat um, Babesia, which um, behaves, uh, is, is a blood parasite, just like um, uh, malaria is, okay? Now, it is a very fat-soluble medication. And, and things that are fat-soluble sometimes can uh, concentrate in the fat layers of your nerves and your brain. And they can be, so these, and so things like the myelin sheath, which is a fat layer that covers your nerves and your brain, and unfortunately, it can sometimes become an irritant to the brain. That sometimes can lead to depression and anxiety. Sometimes I've seen it disturb sleep and, uh, and it can give mood issues as well too. Now the problem is, it, so what I'll do in situations like this is usually I'll try to get a person off. Now, the, the difficulty is don't stop until you talk to your doctor first because you're gonna need to come up with a plan for what's next, okay? Um, the second thing is, is just stopping it will not, cause those symptoms to go away right away. And that is because there is in medicine, we recognize that certain medicines have, take a period of time to get out of your body. And we look at, we measure something called a half-life, the amount of time it takes half of a drug to get out of you once it's in you. And it takes four half-lives for a drug to completely get out of you. So let me look up the half-life of a topical. I know it's long, I just don't know what it is off the top of my head here. Yeah, so it, it takes, a half-life is about 78 hours maybe, okay. So let's do four times 78.
Uh, hold on here just a minute. So four times 78 equals 312 hours divided by 24 equals 13 days. So you may have around two weeks um, still to deal with some of the symptoms, although they should be petering out over that two week period of time, but about two weeks before, even if you stop today, before that medication is out of you, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Ricky. Hello, Ellen again. Let's see here. Hello again, Dr. Ross. I'm wondering about using ashwagandha for endocrine support. Based on Dutch and thyroid test results, I've been on hormone supplementation for several years and I have um, had hypothyroidism for about 10 years. I'm currently on Armour Thyroid, whole adrenal and adrenal cortex and DHEA upon waking. Then an additional adrenal pill plus pregnenolone midday and progesterone at night. Is it safe to add ashwagandha my existing hormone, to my existing hormone support? Would ashwagandha interact with any of them or possibly able to replace them? So ashwagandha, everyone, is an herb that comes to us out of a Chinese medicine and um, Ayurvedic medicine. And it's been observed in, in those cultures, it's used as something called an adaptogen, something that helps the body deal with stress, all right? What animal studies tell us is that the way they probably work is they help your adrenal and your thyroid work better, all right? Now, um, in terms of could it help your, it's possible it may help your thyroid and it may help your adrenals do better. If you were to, if you were my patient and you were to add it in at this point, I would likely have you stop the adrenal, I might consider stopping the adrenal cortex, but I don't know enough of what your laboratory studies show. So you might discuss this. You probably should discuss this with your provider who's been helping you with all this. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Alan. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Dr. Ross. My daughter is treated for Borrelia, Bartonella, and Babesia. She has been on cefuroxime, azithromycin, and ripabutin, and recently developed very intense pain in her temporomandibular joints. Have you seen this? How to address? Is this a sign she's getting worse and treatment doesn't work? All right. So um, sometimes um, pain in the temporomandibular joint can be something associated with Bartonella. I have seen that, okay? Now, if you have recently changed her Bartonella treatment to these antibiotics, and the, the two in here that would treat Bartonella would be the azithromycin and rifibutin here. Um, if you recently changed to those, like within a week or two, and you add those in and you start killing Bartonella, you may trigger a Herx reaction, uh, which is it causes your immune system to make more cytokines. It could show up as joint pain, all right? Otherwise, if it's now showing up, it is possible either your treatment's not working, and the only way I could help figure that out is I need to know more about all the other symptoms she has, okay? Or she's developed a separate problem, all right? So the one thing we have to keep in mind when people have tick-borne diseases is that they actually can develop regular problems that people get to, all right? And so part of the trick of being a, um, a Lyme literate medical doctor is that our job is to try to figure out is this really from the Lyme and the tick-borne infections, or are you just getting the kind of common problem that anyone can get, all right? And so we have to be careful not to put, I call what our Lyme blinders on to see everything as Lyme disease, because everything is not Lyme disease. Uh, we have to make sure there aren't other things that can explain what's going on uh, in a patient, okay? All right. Um, good luck to you, Andrew. Hello, Rick. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thanks for considering my question. Um, you're welcome. Let's see. I am being treated for Lyme, Bartonella, and Babesia and responding well to treatment. 
In fact, I am transitioning from prescription antibiotics to naturopathics. I recently had contact with poison ivy, not my first time. I know that I can't take prednisone, but what about topical application of uh, fluocinonide ointment? Any other suggestions? Do you think that simply by battling poison ivy, my tick-borne treatment will suffer? Okay, so the, the issue with, um, with steroids is if you take systemic steroids, which usually means steroid pills like prednisone or IV steroids, those steroids get into your bloodstream and can suppress your immune system and cause the Lyme germ to take off, okay? Now, the chances of getting systemic absorption from a skin application of an ointment at specific spots that you have, you may get some absorption, but the chances of it being anything major is small. Your risk of getting major immune suppression from doing topical ointment of steroids is quite small, all right? I didn't say it's zero, but I said it's quite small. The other thing to point out is you're already at a point where you've knocked your germ load down quite a bit and you're getting ready to transition. So you're at a place where your immune system probably has jumped in is helping pretty good at this point too. And so you probably um, are at a point that even if you get a little immune suppression here, it's probably not gonna make much of a difference for you. So in this type of a situation, if you were my patient, and I, you're not my patient, okay, but if you were my patient, um, I might say, give it a try, all right? I think, you're, I think your risk of, of having something bad happen from doing it is quite small, actually, okay? All right, thanks for your question, Rick. Hello, Doug D. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thank, thanks for you. You're welcome. Is band 23 specific to BART or just Lyme? Why does glutathione... Oh, you've got a number of questions here. Let's see. I'll try to take these probably more one at a time. Is band 23 specific for BART or Lyme? So band, it depends on how the test technique is done, but if it's done on an immunoblot, band 23 is more specific for Lyme, but it can still have false positives. So for, for something to really be Lyme, you need more than one band showing up on either your immunoblot or your Western blot, and that decreases our chances of having a false positive, okay? Number two, why does glutathione make me feel yucky? So I don't know what you mean by yucky, but one thing I would suggest is sometimes um, when you use glutathione, if you've had a backlog of toxins building up at the liver, taking glutathione will make the, the liver start detoxing better, which causes more toxins to move out where they've been stored in your tissues out into the bloodstream, which can then trigger more cytokines, all right? So um, if you're feeling yucky, which could be because you've had uh, moving toxins, triggers more cytokines, you might want to start at a lower dose on the glutathione, maybe even a quarter of what you were doing and a ramp up and see if you can get to a dose that will work that way. Okay. All right. Number three, what time frame is a HERC? So one to three days, or could it be up to a month later? So typically, so a HERCs, everyone again, is your immune system sees dead bug parts and reacts by making more cytokines. That usually begins within a few days to a week of starting a new antibiotic regimen or increasing doses. Um, so that generally is what the time frame would be for that, okay? Number four, best, strongest herbal bark supplement. Boy, um, I usually like as a starting point, Houtonia, Sita Acuda, and Cinnamon Clove Oregano. Those three together, okay? I tend to have the best results with that, okay? Number five, right now I'm on berberine, turmeric, all of oregano, lumber kinase, methylene blue, cryptolepis, LDN, and a probiotic at night, and NAC. Once in a while, I was currently prescribed rifampicin and doxy, and I started that after my Babesia treatment had completed, but from a 20-year-ago state with antibiotics. Upon taking the doxine rifampus in my stomach is a mess. What do you suggest I do to add my current protocol to make it stronger? So in terms of your doxy and rifampin, both of those can um, give nausea and upset stomach, all right? 
So you may want to talk with your physician and find let him or her know so they can come up with some other prescription options on that as well. In terms of what to make your treatment stronger, you look on a pretty thorough treatment there. And I would need to know more about what your symptoms are so I can help figure out how you retarget this to some degree. And obviously I can't do that in this kind of a setting, okay? Let's see. And finally, my doctor doesn't want to treat for candida, although a tie in my blood, he says I would need endoscopy. Is it really that dangerous to treat candida? Um, so I need to know more. Are you having symptoms related to candida or not? And again, I'd have to ask you a bunch of questions to figure that one out. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Doug. Hello, Chris. Hi, Dr. Ross. I'm currently up to 30 drops each evening for Houtonia and Siddhikuta for Bartonella. Note, I haven't added a morning dose as I feel too poorly taking it two times a day. I have a physically active job and usually within an hour or so of my work day, I begin to feel crummy. Is it possible my system isn't clearing the dead bits sufficiently fast enough and what I'm feeling is a delayed herx brought on by all the physical activity? If so, what do you have your patients found best to address this? Thus far, I haven't found Berber Pinella sufficient or am not using enough. Thanks for all you do. All right, so there, there's an issue um, when you have tick-borne infections, um, and that is um, any degree of physical activity may make you worse. And it's probably neurologically triggered and it leads to more inflammation. So a general rule of thumb I have for people is find a degree of activity you can do that doesn't make you worse. Now, I understand you got to work though, okay? The other reason you may be feeling worse is that from uh, killing your germs that may be triggering increased cytokines within your system. So in a situation like this where somebody has to work, what I'm going to do initially is to try to get stronger about managing those cytokines. So one thing I like to do is to help lower those inflammation cytokines. Again, I talked earlier tonight about what cytokines are, but to lower them, uh, what I like using is curcumin, uh, a liposomal form of curcumin. The product I like for that is something called curcumin phytosome by Thorn. It's a 500 milligram pill. And I would have you take at least one pill three times a day, or if you really want to get strong, two pills three times a day. And what it does is it gets inside of your white blood cells and limits the production factory, factory production line of cytokines, okay? The other thing that can be helpful to add to that to even get stronger about controlling those cytokines is liposomal glutathione. I mentioned that product earlier tonight called Trifortify. And the way you use liposomal glutathione is I would take a teaspoonful one time a day. So you might try adding those in to see if it lowers your overall cytokine load which may give you better resilience throughout the day. Okay, all right. Uh, good luck to you, Chris. Hello, Ellis. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I need your expertise. I have been, or at least, I'm sorry, um, I have been treated with heavy duty anorex for Lyme, Bart, Babesia, and other co infections for over a year and a half and still feel terrible. How do you know if you should continue treating for Lyme? And at what point do you know if you have chronic Lyme arthritis, chronic fatigue syndrome, or fibromyalgia? Are these conditions basically all the same? It's very confusing. Thank you for your time. All right. So to help figure out what's still in you, I would need to ask you a lot of clinical questions. I just want to state that, okay? But I will make one, and then I'll make a second comment. Um, typically, the Lyme germ can take to uh, two, uh, one to two years to get better, sometimes longer, okay? So if you're not improving, it still just may be a matter of time, all right? But when I've got somebody I'm treating, we've already had about a year and we're seeing nothing. I start wondering what else is going on here, all right? And one of the biggest things that could be going on is um, people can have something called mold toxicity. So Mold toxicity, where you get mold toxins trapped in you, looks just like chronic Lyme disease, all right? 
So if you're dumping tons of antibiotics in, you're not getting better. You got to start wondering, is there something else triggering all of my excess cytokines, which is giving me all these symptoms? And one of the big things can be mold toxins got trapped in you. So briefly, um, there's, uh, there's been a physician named Richie Shoemaker who first discovered that about 25% of us have a genetic profile where we're programmed in a way that our bodies will not break down mold toxins when we breathe them in and they get in our blood through our lungs, all right? What is supposed to happen in, and, and what happens in 75% of us is um, our immune systems will see those mold toxins in our blood. Some, some of the immune cells will tag them. Other white blood cells will come in and break those mold toxins down. But 25% of people, what happens is those uh, mold toxins don't get tagged by the immune system and they don't get broken down. The next line of defense in removing fat-based toxins like mold is supposed to be the liver. And the liver is supposed to make uh, add some water-soluble chemical groups to the mold toxins and move them and then make them water-soluble. But the liver doesn't do that either. And so they go from the intestine or from the liver out into the intestines as a fat-soluble toxin, still not a water-soluble. If they're water-soluble, they're mixing our poop and poop them out but they go out as a fat soluble toxin and then out in the intestines, they get reabsorbed again. And all those toxins keep triggering cytokines, okay? So a place to start when you're not getting better, especially this far out, is look to see if you have mold toxicity. And the best way to do that is to use a urine test that will see if you're peeing out too many mold toxins. And the one I prefer of all the options out there is a lab called Real-Time Labs out of Texas. The other other option you might look at is to use a lab called Mosaic Diagnostics, which used to be just recently changed its name from Great Plains Lab. And they have a pretty decent test, but it's not as strong at picking up black mold toxins. All right. So the issue with mold toxicity is you could have been in buildings, uh, old homes, previous workplaces, where you slowly were breathing in small amounts. You didn't even know the building had mold in it. And then, and then over time, you acquire enough mold toxins that they make you sick, all right? Now, in my own practice, one of the first things I always try to do at a first visit with somebody is to try to figure out if there is an obvious exposure they had to black mold and does that, or any kind of mold actually, and does that correspond to when they got sick, all right? So let me just briefly give you an example of that. So one of the sickest patients I ever had was a physician, a patient that was referred, was brought in actually by his mother, who's a nurse. And this guy came in because he had severe cognitive impairment, uh, bad body pain, severe, severe fatigue. And he had gotten so sick that he basically lost his job. Um, he already lost his kids and um, he was in bad shape. And he had seen a naturopathic doctor, a colleague of mine in Seattle, who basically did test him for Lyme. The test came back positive. I believe he had a history of a tick bite in there. So she automatically assumed it was Lyme. Sounds like it, right? And he had a positive test and he had all the symptoms of Lyme. But I know that people that have a positive Lyme test and a lot of symptoms of Lyme, that it's not always Lyme. And so what I did is I, I'm always asking what else could be triggering those cytokines that give you all those symptoms that look like Lyme. And keep in mind, a Lyme test is measuring whether you make antibodies against the germ. It just says, have you had an immune reaction? Well, it's possible in some people that their immune system gets rid of the germ. And even though they have all those Lyme symptoms, it's something else triggering the cytokines that give those Lyme symptoms, okay? So as I took his history, I, I said, what were you doing in your life when you got sick? He goes, well, I just moved into this new home. And I go, new or old? He goes, well, it's an old home. And I, I go, yeah, I said, tell me about that house. Anything going on odd in any of the rooms? He goes, well, yeah, they used to have a big, people before me had a big um, aquarium in the back room. And we discovered there was a lot of mold back in that room. <laughs> so he didn't get sick until he had his mold exposure. And so all I did with him, we did a real-time test, came back positive. I think I spent four to six months cleaning mold toxins out of him. And he got 100% well. I did nothing to deal with his Lyme because likely what had happened with his Lyme is his immune system handled it. And all we were measuring is an immune reaction that showed he had had the germ in him, right? So anyhow, just keep that in mind, okay? You've got to always be 
looking for mold toxin illness if you're not getting better, all right? And I always have people look for it at the beginning of a treatment as well too, okay? All right. So everyone, um, that is it for me for tonight. I, I had a great time visiting with you here. And many of you know I wasn't here with you last week as I was um, on my way of packing up my Seattle office and moving down to Austin. But it's good to be here and um, we'll be back here again with you in two weeks. I'm taking next week off because again, I only do three of these a month. And so look to see me on two Thursdays. Um, tomorrow morning, you're getting an email from me announcing that the recording of the webinar is done. And within that um, email, you'll also get a summary of what we talked about. And then you'll also get links to sign up for the June series of uh, conversa or conversations with Marty Ross MD. Um, do me a favor. Um, when you get that email tomorrow morning, send it to people who you think might get benefit from these. All right. If you're getting benefit, others with the illness probably will too. All right. Help me reach more people. I'd appreciate that. Good night, everyone. Take care.